So I'm with uh, Carl the Duke here, the son of the legendary Paul the Duke. He's wrestled for WWE Stampede Wrestling in Memphis. Uh, and he's very well known here in Quebec and he's wrestled all over Canada. So uh, the first thing I guess I want to ask you is what's it like growing up the son of Paul the Duke at a time when uh, wrestling in Quebec was so popular? Uh, at first, when I was a kid, I liked it, you know, because I had all the attention of the people. When I used to go out, uh, my, my dad used to go out shopping and everything. People uh, stopped and photograph, and my dad was always taking time to talk and sign autograph. And I, I and when I was a young kid, around five or six years old, I knew I was gonna, I want to try to be a become a pro wrestler later on in my career, later on in my life. So uh, yeah, I, I find that fascination there, a part that. And intrigued, and I used to, um, but I never saw really my dad wrestle. But I used to watch my uncle, and every time he was coming around the house, he always come sleep at the house, and uh, he always bring me to the show, uh, going backstage, meet some guys, and I guess I was born, in, and it's in my blood, and I always been around. So I said I figured out one day I, I want to try it. So that's how. Uh, kind of got interested in wrestling and uh, be the son of uh, of my dad uh, opened me doors but when you put your foot inside the door it's difficult because they're going to compare you about, uh, with your family so if you do good oh it's because it's the son of but if you do bad oh he's the, he's a second generation doesn't know how to wrestle and then get all that that peer pressure especially when you go out and wrestle you got a lot of guys backstage will go look to the curtain to see your mistakes or to see what you can do and everything. So uh, even until today, I still feel the pressure though, but I guess uh, I learned to live with it, you know, so. Yeah. Was it your dad that actually trained you? Uh, no, my dad was really, uh, he started me to explain how it works and everything, but he's, he was a sick person. And then he was, he ended up to be in the hospital and Jacques Rougeau uh, Jr., um, he came in, in he, he went to saw my dad at the, um, uh, at the hospital and everything, and then uh, my dad was talking about me and everything. And then uh, he was uh, Jacques was leaving the WWF, so he was opening a wrestling school. So uh, he asked my dad if he can uh, if I can be his first student. So I was his first student when he opened the school in '95. Um, yeah, that's how I got it. And then before Jacques did his retirement match, we met the Hearts, Brett and Hohen. Uh, my dad brought me to them and meet them backstage at the show uh, for the retirement of, of Jacques match at WWF, back then it was called. And then uh, they saw my size and then they said, oh, you should try to put your kid uh, in the wrestling business. Plus when Jacques came to see my dad, so one plus one equal two. So that's how I started and I broke in the business. And you went to WWE pretty quick, didn't you, the first yeah, time? How did that happen? To be honest with you, I had a bad experience with Jacques. Um, didn't get really trained. Um, I went on tour with him, stuff passed, uh, and then uh, I was getting some pop. Jelly C came up there, he brought me one day in the parking lot, made me cry in the car, and then I went to my dad, and then we decided to left tour and everything. And then from there... Because he did a tour around Quebec when yeah, he retired. Quebec, yeah, when he retired with his little group there. And he had the doorman back then, he used to wrestle and everything. And then the news reporter, since my dad was well-known famous wrestler and he was in the and after he worked in the media so for me when I was hitting a town people used to come and interview me and everything but the star of the promotion back then was two two guys and the team was called the doorman but I was having a lot of coverage and a lot of publicity and then um, Abdullah was on the card and then uh, everybody uh, came uh, you have to do a running and then Jock used to supposed to come and save everybody but when I was the last one to come out before Jacques and then when I step in the ring uh, Abdullah said back up back up look to the people so they can remember the Leduc and the history of the butchers back in the 70s and the 80s and everything so I back up I listen to the advice of um, of Abdullah and then people start screaming my name and then Jacques they liked it and everything so I guess I had a really bad experience with him uh, but you have to start somewhere and always your first experience is always bad so what did he say to you in the car that uh, upset you so much uh, what upset me too much uh, he said I think uh, you want to be you try to be a bigger superstar than me and everything and then all kind of bullshit so I decided to uh, I cried basically you know he was pretty hard words you know 
And then... Because uh, you were how old at that time? Oh, I was beginning there, man. I was like, let's say I was maybe... Well, it's in 95 when 2016, I'm going to get 42 next week. So just just do the math and you'll figure out how old I was. Around 18, 19, 20 years old, maybe, I guess, because I was 21 years old. So yeah, I was 21 years old, but I was still fresh and went, you know, do good and everything. But I had, a, I had enough of my, my share fare of being bullied by him. Um, so that's what happened. So we left. We went back home. And then I started for... Uh, uh, NCW, WTA in Quebec with Bertrand Bar and everything. Uh, they kind of try teach me the ropes with his brother and uh, Frank Blues and everything. And then from there, I had a call from Joan Rougeau and uh, and Ray. And then Pat Patterson came to see me watch wrestle. Because Joanne worked for WWE. Yeah, that back then she was so a promoter. Yeah, so in Raymond, but uh, Jacques was was out. Jacques wasn't talking to Raymond yeah, at that no, point. No, there was none of the talking with the family and everything. And then I started wrestling the little independent circuit. Even if I didn't have no training, really, uh, people were hiring me because of the name and everything. And then... Uh, uh, Joanne called yeah, you. Joanne called me and I was still wrestling. I was wrestling for WTA. It was in Mascouche in front of 25 people. And, and then uh, Pat Patterson was in the crowd with a baseball cap just disguise and just to watch the show and everything and then after that uh, I met him shortly talk shortly and then uh, Joan contacted me afterward I don't know if they had a connection but who knows Joan uh, brought me wanted to give my chance and everything with Ray and then they gave me tryout I traveled uh, with them and uh, I went to go see some pay-per-views and Raw when it was not live when, when it was recorded well, uh, on Sundays, like the fourth show of the month, and after I was going to the annual house pay per view backstage, and then Raymond started introducing me to some people, and I started having some matches. And afterwards, um, I didn't have a full contract back then, it was like kind of an independent contract. I was there was no day. development, yeah, territory. no, not even I was not even existed after that. When I came, it was developmental contract, so I did tours with them, travel in those private jets, the jet, like you know, like the high lifestyle. And then what happened is um, I was, they were hiring me where my uncle Joel Duke was really popular. So most likely east of Canada, the Maritime, and the southern uh, southern east uh, of uh, the United States, like Nashville, Memphis, uh, uh, Atlanta, uh, uh, you know, like Kentucky. Um, so I was traveling around there man, with those guys. And then um, I didn't know how to wrestle, basically. So for me, that was a hard time. And then I uh, did my first match with them, like in Montreal, was August 2nd, 96. I used to wrestle with Bra against GBL. You used to be called Justin Ock Bradshaw, but today it's GBL. I didn't know how to, I didn't even know how to do a small package, and that was my finish, and I, he had to put me over. And then that was the night that Ray had that boxing match with Owen Hart. That was the first event at the Molson Center, right? Yeah, the Molson Center ever. So I opened for WWF. The first ever match, wrestling match, was taking place at the you Molson Center. You did the first Center. one yeah, at the, the, first the one. Ottawa. After Canada. Ottawa, Quebec, yep. and then the Maritime Tour, and then the Southern Tour in the States. Mm -hmm. And then what happened is I didn't know to, I'll be honest, I didn't know to do a small package. And then uh, that was my finish, and I was going to go over. And the Briscoe told me, you're going over, man. It's your town and everything. We want you to, after your victory, to raise your hand and look and pop the crowd and everything. And uh, I was surprised. I was shocked. I was really nervous. And then Ray came before. He said, you know what? You're a Duke. You got a name and everything, but uh, there's American people. Uh, you're not going to go over. I don't want you to have a fit to, uh, you know, just stay humble if you don't go over or nothing. And I'll be surprised if they're going to put you over. So I said, well, I don't care. I just want my chance just to be seen. And after that, if I can go somewhere afterwards. But I came, I remember I came and see Ray said, they're putting me over. And Ray, Raymond was really surprised and was happy and everything. And Bratsch uh, was, his manager was Dutch Mantel back then. Uh, I think, what's his new name? Zeb. Zeb, Zeb Calther. Zeb. And him, he was really hot that I was getting over. So him, he wants me after the match to get a beating by GBL. And then uh, after the agent came, said, no, it's not supposed to be like that. 
what I was supposed to be. Like. He was Uncle Zebekiah back yeah, then, right? Yeah, yeah, Uncle Zebekiah. He was really hot. Did not a wrestle. I can't understand him. I got to put his guy over. He's yeah. got to put his guy's got to put me over. So, but uh, GBL was really nice. Uh, shot his mouth. Uh, looked me look good in that match, you know. And he brought me and he told me, kid, it's gonna go great. You know, I'll make sure that everything's okay for you. So that was nice, and I was touring against him, and they were putting me over. So, and one day, and also in Ottawa, I came with a Quebec thing, you know, the lumberjack, you know, like the politics, English, French, separatists, and uh, federalism going down back then was pretty hard. 95, we just got out of uh, like referendum. Uh, the referendum and stuff like that. So, for Americans watching this that don't know, there is a feud between French and English people Yeah, in big feud and everything, you know. And then uh, what happened is uh, people started booing me. He was ill and I was supposed to go out as a baby face. So what GBL did to us, so I can have the, the face pop uh, in the ring, he, said, so he yelled something to the crowd and everything. The crowd started booing him and the crowd started che che cheering for me. And after that, when we came to Quebec City, uh, they put me against Owen Hart, and then uh, Owen wanted to put me over back then, but uh, the office said no, no experience and everything, so I didn't mind. It was Owen Hart, man, it's, you know, like the Hart family, the dynasty, you know, they're no world, worldwide, and Owen was pretty nice uh, in the ring, gave me a good match, end up being, end up, I got caught up in a sharpshooter, I had to tap out. But I didn't really care back then because it was Warren Hart, you know. And me being with those big guys, I was still a fan just watching the, just watching the wrestling. And I was still like, wow, amazed being backstage with the guy traveling with, uh, traveling with the boys, you know. Like uh, uh, my roommate was Owen for the hotel rooms. Owen told me, said, um, you know what, I do enough money, I can pay my own hotel room. You're just a new kid and everything. I'll let you share my room and you keep your money. But the money that they make you saving on the road, you have to send it back to your dad because you gotta remember where you're coming from. So you see that owner had a big heart and had a nice philosophy. And then I was and then uh, I was going to the gym with the British Bulldog, train my weights. And afterwards, my, my traveling partner cars was uh, what Bob was, Ollie. Uh, what was the British Bulldog like? Oh, uh, he, uh, he was intense. He was nice to me, I guess, because maybe because Second generation, you respect that, that, I don't know. And I was under like, uh, and then uh, because uh, Owen decided me to took me out under his wing back then, because I was getting ribbed a lot with the guys hiding some piece of uh, clothing so I cannot, I'm missing a, a, part, a piece of something going to the ring and everything. And then Owen, um, Owen kind of took me uh, under his belt and the ribs start like backstage start stopping against me. But the Bulldog was uh, helping me to push a lot in the weights. Uh, it was the first time I was able to bench three plates. Because they were there, they were watching me, and I was all intense and everything. I wanted to prove myself. And like I said, and, uh, my traveling partners for car rides between towns when we were driving was uh, Sid Vicious, Psycho Sid, but you prefer to be called Sid Vicious. And it was Bob Ali. So What were those guys like? You know what? Sid... When he saw me, he said, I don't give a damn about you. I got no respect. But the only reason why we, why you're driving with me, because uh, I used to be a big fan of uh, of your uncle, Joe LeDuc. And I used to carry... Oh, he's from Memphis. Yeah. Right? Joe was huge there. Yeah, and then he used to carry, uh, to get free in the wrestling show, he used to carry my, my, my uncle's luggage to the show. And he used to watch... Watch how my uncle was doing interview, mic work, and uh, how he wrestled and everything. So you're just a piece of shit to you, but uh, because of your uncle, uh, I'll take care of you, and you'll be driving with me. And uh, and he was buying me dinner on the road because I was not making much back then, and they were making a lot. So that was kind of nice, though. What was Bob Holly like? Because there's always conflicting stories. Yeah, conflicting happened. stories. But back then he was spark plug. Yeah. Oh, Sparky plug. Yeah, Sparky plug back yeah. then. So that was before he was like the enforcer. Of yeah, the enforcer and everything. So it was pretty quiet deal and uh, work hard in the gym and everything. And I guess try to, to climb up the ladder like everybody used to want to be climb up and everything. And uh, and I got another thing there. Uh, they put me against the Sultan in the Maritime. 
who was Rakishi. Yeah, it was Rakishi and everything. And him, he didn't have no respect about me, obviously, because um, I didn't know how to wrestle. Let's be honest, before I didn't know how to do nothing. And he, and then uh, during the match was pretty hard, pretty stiff. And uh, he used to give me a beating, a straight beating there, man, you know. The guy was ribbing me, fucking uh, was real punches inside of the ring. Yeah. And I remember Jim Corderas there, he used to be like the referee. I look at him and said, man, can you do something? He'd look at me. So that's how I learned how it works pretty. Yeah. So I, you know what, I started like in the NHL because your dad was Guy Lafleur. Oh, you just starting your life will put you uh, first line. Uh, hockey player star or whatever or something like that so I was caught in between that and everything the face Aldo Montoya yeah you had to put me over but Owen went he was part of the clique back yeah. then that was the Godwins Triple H and Shawn Michael was running the backstage pretty much back then and um, oh the Godwins were part of that too. yeah I was yeah. traveling with them and everything and then um, Owen talked to um, Aldo Montoya uh, it was just incredible today. He said, uh, remember where you're coming from. I want you to make that kid look good. We know he doesn't have no experience, but uh, we're going to hook him up something later in the future for him. So just for the time being, just respect the kid and make him look good. So so obviously... Uh, that was at Hall, right? Yeah, I was at Hall at... Um, Where's the Olympic Robert Hall? Gertin. Yeah, Robert, Robert, Robert Gertin Arena. I have a, that was, I think, one of my best matches on the tour. You know, no, I didn't. I remember miss. being at that one actually. Yeah, and then, uh, and then um, we're doing back and forth because it was so uh, confused that those days for me. Uh, I remember in Ottawa, Triple H tried to shit disturb, disturb me. Um, uh, came to me said, "Oh, uh, GBL's pretty stiff guy and everything with that clothesline. Did he hurt you and stuff like that?" And I said, uh, yeah, he was stiff, but I didn't know how it works, the shit disturbing thing, you know? So he went back to go see GBL, GBL come to me. But uh, yeah, man, it's, that was... Yeah, for people that don't know, there's a yeah. lot of backstage stuff that goes on. Yeah, because back then, man, if you didn't know nobody, man, you're on your own. And then you can, that was a tough, tough, tough. Today, the new kids who go up there, they're protected. If, if you do something like that, Triple H will not accept and he will fire you on the spot. So it's not like in the old days. The old days paying your dues was backstage, you know, and then it was tough. And then uh, wrestle Rakishi, and then after that, they sent me home. They went for the Survivor Series pay-per-view, and then they called me back, and I came back. And then Billy Gunn said, oh my God, Babyface the Duke is back. So that's when the boys start to kind of respect me because they thought I'm, I'm going to quit. But I didn't quit. I got the beating backstage. I got the beating in the ring. Uh, I got, uh, and then uh, me, I was afraid, but I bought out some few people out there also just to, to, to show that I can do, uh, I can prove myself. So I had a lot of scuffling there backstage and in the ring also. So what happened is, um, what happened there uh, with Raki there, uh, he started respecting me and everything and then um, uh, that was a little bit more uh, casual and the way you're supposed to go in the ring afterwards and then when I decidedly left those guys he gave me one I, as much I hated that guy back then because I used to work a lot of nights against him uh, the biggest advice that he told me said you're not ready kid obviously I know he said go learn your craft and uh, I'll give you one advice you do whatever you want to do with it. Listen, open your ears, listen to every advice. And if you think that advice is good for you, keep it for you. If it's not good, don't say to the guy who's teaching you advice that you don't need it. Just keep it in your ear and throw it in the basket. Even if it's the, even if it's the President of the United States gave you that advice, if you think does it fit to you, and it's somebody, uh, a small guy who's giving you an advice, and that advice fit, suits you or fits you better than you, Keep that advice and keep it towards you and work with that advice. So it took me many years to understand that. And when I understand that, I kind of understood what he did in the ring. You know, that's the way he used to work back then, you know. And then, or, and then Owen said, you want a six month, a year career, or you want a 25 year career? I said, obviously I want a 25 year career. So he said, kid, you're not ready to be with us. You know, so I'll give you an advice. 
I'll send you to Bruce Hart, who's my brother, in the dungeon. Go learn your craft. Go learn how to be a referee. Go learn how to be a manager. Go learn how to be a, uh, a wrestler. So, because if you stay with us uh, the next six months, you'll be burned, you'll quit the business, and you'll never able to wrestle again ever because you'll be like, um, you know, you'll be you'll be looked like as a, a no good person to use at, at their wrestling show. So that's what happened. So when I finished my tour with them and my contract, my independent, like my day contract with them, uh, in 97 January, I took a plane, flew to Calgary, and then uh, I met Bruce Ross, who was the teacher back then. And then uh, Owen set me up to live at Stu, Stu Hart House. I used always to call him Mr. Hart. I got a funny story with him. Yeah. To say. You're in the Wrestling with Shadows documentary, right? That yeah. Robert did. You're getting stretched today, right? Yeah, what happened out, I got stretched is because uh, when I came there, I tried to be a smart ass and asked Mr. Hart, can you stretch me? Can you stretch me? He said, you know what? I don't do no more stretching at my age. Forget about it, kid. I'm not going to stretch you. And then after six months of my training and everything, he used to come watch me and everything. So he saw I was progressing. He saw I was kind of tough. And he saw I was paying my dues. And then bef that was my second stretching by Stu, what he saw in the Bret and the uh, Hitman in the Shadow with Bret Hart. Uh, what happened is... Um, uh, they had a in your house pay-per-view Calgary something. Oh, uh, Canadian Stampede. Yeah, Can Canadian Stampede, and all the people came, uh, all the wrestlers, the premier, the uh, uh, Calgary Stampeder. A lot of bunch of people came to the hard house. Uh, to the hard house for a dinner gathering for a barbecue and stuff like that. So in front of everybody, said, "Kid, remember when you asked me six months earlier <laughs> if I want to stretch you?" I said, "Yeah." You know what? I told you I was not doing anymore, but I think you're ready. It's time. Get on the floor. So uh, that's how I got in front of everybody, all the boys and everything. I got my first stretching, and on that first stretching, I passed out because I was so proud. So I didn't want to squeal and everything. And for him, not hearing me squeal, he was adding more pressure, more pressure. Of course, at his age, he couldn't catch you and put. You have to, yeah. you have to give your body. Be. Yeah. Give your body, but as soon as the lock is down, you couldn't, no way out. No, no way out. So uh, I faint. I passed out because I had so much pride, you know? Because those guys saw me on the tour, I want to prove that I, I improved myself, you know? And I was tougher and uh, I was kind of paying my dues and just staying in the business. And then. Um, you didn't tap out like CM Punk did. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know what? I got to lift my hat up, you know? It's. It's awkward the CM Punk thing there, you know. It's pretty awkward in a way that I don't know if uh, I don't know if I was cheering for him or against him. I don't know if it's good for the business or bad. But at the end, man, he, that's what he wanted to do. It. He had the balls to do it, even if he had no really technical background or stuff like that. He went at it, experienced it. I think we all know what the outcome of the result. But hey. I'll lift my hat up to that even if he went through that process and he did it, you know. And we'll see if it's going to be benefit for his career or not. But you know what? Uh, I think he's secure financially enough that, uh, oh, yeah. that uh, no matter what, he can just stop working for the rest of his life and he'll be wealthy, you know. So thumbs up for that. But, but you were stretched by Stu, you passed yeah, out. I passed and, out. Yeah. And then after that, they were filming. Uh, the documentary on Brett, and then Brett came up to one of our uh, wrestling session on a Wednesday. He asked to the boys in the training camp, anybody wants to show up tomorrow morning for the documentary because we need a wrestler to get stretched by uh, by my dad. So <laughs> the next day, so the people were talking to themselves. They said, well, I'm not going to go stretch like that. I don't want to look like a fool. That's not going to be good for my career and stuff like that. So no one show up in the dungeon when it was time. But me, I show up. I was the first guy who show up, man, from, uh, from my camp. And then the, um, Brett told me, he said, you know what, it's going to you know, thank you that you came. The only one that you came through and everything. And do you know, do you realize what? What that documentary can, uh, you know, give you back in return and everything, exposure worldwide, getting your name out like uh, out 
out no matter what they are coming for you uh, we're, you know we want to show the heart and the craft of what my dad got famous worldwide with and you came in and accepted our respect that that's what he told me words for word. it was seven o'clock in the morning when we did that filming and uh, yeah man that was that was a good experience and obviously brought me some contract you know uh, and got my reputation as a tough guy inside the ring you know as much as when I got bullied then I became the guy who could bully other people because people were kind of afraid and stepped back down and everything you know so and how did you end up in Memphis from Calgary uh, Memphis and Calgary after a year and a half that I trained in, in the dungeon and everything uh, Stu was telling me that uh, you know what after a certain time you need to get experience man I think it's time to get experience and everything and my dad was in contact with Bill Barron Bill Barron was a good guy in a way that was, he was, he was um, taking care of TV contract for the big companies, wrestling company in the States and everything. So I think that's some um, uh, exchange words with, with my dad and everything and they wanted to give me a chance. So it's Bill Barron who brought me basically down in Tennessee. Yeah, yeah so that's why I started in 98. he worked for TNA for a long yeah, time as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but before he called TNA and everything, was still the underground local company and afterward few years after it became TNA so you know in wrestling you know that's remind me to say that in wrestling you gotta be there the, it's, it's it's all about timing when you get the big the big push or, or the timing you get hired and stuff like that but since for me I always like six months to a year a year and a half or two years before that the big thing started big you know so I miss a lot of timing about that you know uh, you know, so I, you know, I was I wrestled against. Uh, you had guys like uh, Flash Flanagan. Uh, you had uh, Bill Dundee. You had the uh, Wolfie D, and then uh, GC Ice with their PJ13, I guess, and ECW afterwards. Uh, Brick Brown House was there in Tennessee. Um, Did you ever face Lawler while you were down there? Yeah, I didn't really face him, but when I went to Power Pro Wrestling back then, to paying your dues, you had a lot of big wrestling in good shape. You come early in the morning to put the chair up, set up the ring, and just wait there to, to see that they can have a spot. Yeah. Me, I walk in there. My first thing was t a TV thing. Like, a, oh, uh, they're putting me a TV interview against Slaughter and everything. So a lot of wrestlers backstage are asking me, how do you get that pushing there? You come, you didn't pay your dues, you didn't set up the ring, you didn't put the chair up, and they put you on TV. I said, man, to myself, it's nothing. It's like an interview is going to last 30 seconds or something like that. So uh, I did an interview and everything. And then um, they, didn't sh they didn't show all the interview, but you can see a clip on YouTube there for Power Pro Wrestling. But I said, uh, I said, man, I'm facing Lauder. The thing is, they were supposed to give me the mic, and I was supposed to mumble like a, like a, like a retarded person on the mic. But I said to myself, I want to prove Vince... That I can do mic work and stuff like that. Is that that time Memphis was working with WWE? Yeah. No, I'm not. Or starting to some sign up. Yeah, Brian Christopher Stadiak was there. Sean Stadiak. Carl Ouellette was there yeah. for a while. No, too, but not the same time as me though. Okay. So a little bit later maybe. But uh, everybody wants to impress Lauder and Lauder backstage. You can't even talk to him if you talk to him. You gotta wait that he got when the guy walks in the locker room. You gotta wait that he comes to say hi to you. You cannot say hi to him before. So I didn't know that because he was so famous there. He yeah, was he was so famous. So me, I did kind of. I said something. I said, you know, Lauder, stop calling yourself a king. The real king was dead 25 years ago, and I'm here to take back what is mine. Uh, uh, you build that territory on my uncle's back, and I take. I'm here to take back what is mine. So they didn't like it at all. And then, uh, but they didn't show all the interview there on TV. I think they, they cut it up or something. And then um, they didn't like that I talk on the mic and everything. But me, to myself, I was getting high five in my head. Thought I was score a home run, man. You know, I think it was a good interview with Lawler and everything. But I learned that he cannot try to be bigger than the king there, you know, yeah. like, or the guy, or the head guy, you know, you cannot overshine the, the person who's running the thing there, or who, who's the man in the place and everything, just like if you do a pile driver in Lauder's territory, you can be banned from the territory, you know, stuff like that was back then, it was pretty hard, so, um, that's what happened, and then I thought I was getting a high five, I said, I'll go backstage, man, 
and then people were like, all their heads was like this, not talking to me, so something's wrong. So I go to my place, look for my luggage, didn't find it. So my luggage ended up to be in the parking lot. So I did Power Pro Wrestling, I did, um, I traveled with Rex, and Rex got no fucking license, no plates or nothing. And then uh, he told me, he said, don't, f don't look nobody outside when you're driving on the highway. Here's a gun in the uh, in the glove compartment, one yeah. under the seat and one behind there. If something happened, man, you gotta <laughs> take the gun and shoot someone, man. Yeah. It's like, fuck, man. So the 90s, I learned it pretty hard, though, you know? So you never had the match with Lawler because No, Lawler. no, never, never end up. Not, they, they scrapped the script. They scrapped yeah. everything. They're there. Could it be good, though, you know? You know, but... Because um, your uncle was really over it in Memphis. Really over it in Memphis. He was one of the toughest... I don't want to brag about it, but Joe LaDuke was one of the top... Like, the toughest and one of the top heel in the States in the 80s and... Uh, big time, man. He had Jimmy Hart to uh, to manage him, Humperdinck to manage him, you know, uh, Paul Bear used to be Percy um, Pringle. Pringle used to manage him. Uh, he used to go out against big names, the Dusty Rhodes and uh, the Lawler and the uh, Bruiser Body and all those big names back then. My uncle was on top there, you know. And, uh, he, and he was in WWE for a while too. Yeah, like but he got kind of, yeah, but brief time. Uh, the way that he got up there, I think it was all Kogan. Um, all Kogan used to like my uncle a lot. I think that's something a favor happened in the past and everything. And then uh, Ogan get a, give get give a piece to uh, of his yeah. movie No Whole Bar, a part into that movie. Yeah. And then um, remember it was He's in one of the bar scenes. Yeah, right? the bar scene and everything. And then um, and then. Um, Zeus was to do, they were supposed to do Zeus against Olga in each town, but Zeus back then was a, an actor, did not really wrestle. So my uncle was supposed to replace Zeus and do all those big things there. Oh, really? Yeah, against Olga, I guess. That's what the, the story that hurt. So I don't know if it's true, how much is true in it, because you never know what wrestling, what is true, what is not. Always two sides of, uh, of a cover book, you know? So, uh, and then he started as a uh, as a headbanger or something like that. Did some matches there, but he let's be honest. I don't want to bash him, but he had alcohol problem, so he got fired over it man, because he missed some dates on the road and everything. Ogan opened the doors, and then Ogan came to him and said, "I can't help you no more, man. I, I try to help you, bring you, bring you in, and then you got you know you got fired. I cannot do nothing. So sorry, Joe, but that's how it ended up with him." and everything, you know, so that was pretty bad, but that's life, I guess, man, the guy gave a lot to the business, back then the business was really hard, you know, you're doing territories by territories, three months there, three months there, uh, you didn't have the, the money as today, uh, the travels, uh, the traveling facility as, as today, you know, so that's what happened, you had an alcohol problem there back then, a lot of wrestlers back then, you yeah, know, it was part of the business, it was part of the business, you know, so, and you ended up training some wrestlers too. Over yeah, the years. but before I went to the training, I went to learn my craft in the dungeon for four years and everything. Went to Tennessee, then didn't work out. Came back, and then uh, a school, uh, Spit Heart was opening a school in Cambridge, Kitchener, and everything. And uh, and then um, I broke my leg in Calgary also, man. So that kind of uh, turned me off to go pursue more so I said you know what that was in a match right? yeah that was in a match and everything I was doing a, a big stunt the Japanese was there it was TV there and everything and then uh, I had to be for the guy because he said uh, used to be the king but I'm the new king I'm not gonna let you my spot so one of us gotta leave town and then uh, I don't want you and he begged me to not hurt him in the ring and uh, after the match we're supposed to finish out in the locker room, just like the, it's supposed to do when you have a beef in the wrestling in the 90s, in my time, it's, uh, you lock yourself in the locker room with the guy only, and the first guy got out, you know, he's the winner, or he's the new king, we, he was the king. Was, so I try to fight back my title, but I said I'll do it professionally, professionally way and wisely by showing my skills in the ring and everything, because now I had a lot of training in the dungeon, I think the dungeon was the best training. I travel a lot with Bruce Hart. Bruce Hart gave me a lot of good advice, really a lot of good advice. 
and then uh, he kind of took me under his wing because maybe I was coming from Owen, and he had a he had a kid also um, who's handicapped and everything. But Red. I took you, yeah. Reth. You know, yeah. you know, you've been there. You met him, yeah. and I was the only wrestler that um, that he I was able to have contact with him and everything since I was living at in the family also for four years and everything so um, and the other wrestler tried to approach him but he can't feel that if you're fake or not and me I was not trying to look better to have some favors or whatever uh, I got that type of person that uh, when, I, when I approach somebody and if I got a connection I'll do everything for that person you know so that's what I did I had a good connection so yeah so um, after I broke my leg a few stuff happened down there uh, my time was pretty much done, I guess. Learn everything I need to learn. What was that incident you were telling me earlier? It's been written about in a couple of books with Davy Boy Smith. You know, it's hard for me to talk to it, but uh, what I can say that the guy broke my, my leg because I want to respect Ari, I want to respect yeah, Georgia yeah. and everything. Uh, and they've been good to me. Davy Boy was really good to me and everything. So what I can say about that is... Um, I was back home healing my leg and then I had a call to come back and train and everything. And then, uh, and then uh, Stu told me, he said, don't go in the, in the street to go hit him or something, get trouble with the police. Just like I said, we'll lock you up in the dungeon and you can take care of what you have to take care of and take all the, the rage that he got, him, got, he got in. Because in wrestling business, what you gotta know guys, uh, you're the star. I gotta put you over. I'm jealous of you. So we'll do our routine, we'll do our spots and everything. And then I broke your leg or I broke you something. The show must go on. So you sidelining, you're riding the, the bench and then the promoter's gonna look at me and will give me my chance to shine. And if I pop and if it works, when you come back, it's gonna be harder to take back your spot, right? So that's used to work and that's how I've been learned. And then, um, yeah, man. This. So what happened is that he, this guy broke my leg, did it on purpose, came to the hospital, said next time it's going to be worse, so I want you to leave Calgary. So I said, never mind, I'm going to come back and kick your ass. So in the meantime, I, uh, the, 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 the camp was finishing, and then everybody left. We locked the doors in, and then I saw um, Davey came and knocked the door out and gave a beating there, man. I was there live. And I was getting a beating also to that guy. His real name is James Treble, but his wrestling name was Butt Kiss. Until today, I hate this guy, man, because he did it on a purpose of jealousy, man. When you do that, man, it's wrong. You should not put your foot in the wrestling. You're not deserving to be in a ring anymore. You know, so that's kind of my payback I got, got towards him. And whatever he did to the family, Davy Boy's, Davy Boy Smith's family there, uh, I'll let him to him. But I don't so he strike two with two people man and Davy Boy is the kind of guy who will help. He used to come and watch us at wrestling because Harry was starting to train with us with TJ who is Tyson kid today. Um, he was nice to come and give advice or hang around, show him his title belts, you know. We're all impressed with the kids and uh, with the we're kids still. Yeah. All impressed by that. So he gave a lot of time and tried to do something personal to the family, attack the family just to get your goal and try to get an higher step. That's not the way it works. So uh, yeah man, it's, it was really bad and um, I had a chance to put my hand and DV was there. So poor guy man. I don't know if he wrestled today. I don't give a damn. But if for sure if I saw him in a wrestling show I crossed my path till today. The war is not over and I'll take care of business again. Because uh, he still got to pay. He doesn't deserve to wrestle again. Because me took a lot of time. When I broke my leg, I got th th one screw, one screw, one screw, and one nail from attaching my leg. And I'll tell you a story what Davy Boy Smith did, which is too hard. Um, I'm French Canadian, province of Quebec. My province is separatist province. They want to separate again. I rest Canada and everything. I was in the hallway for three days and the blood was going through my bone. They didn't want to operate me, they didn't want to touch me. Even my other, other private healthcare was, Alberta was accepting them, the doctor came to me and said, you know what, you, you Frenchmen, you guys in Quebec, uh, you want to separate and everything and you want me to operate you and do a good job. Uh, you guys get your operation up here 
and then after that you leave and, you know, and then your province don't pay the bill back you know through the medical care and everything so I'm not operating you man you're on your own so I start crying man call my dad my dad was hopeless and everything could do nothing and then I called Stu and Davy boy came to the hospital with Stuart, talked to the doctor, and he yeah. said to the doctor, man, trust that kid. He's gonna fill up the papers, he's gonna go to his province, he's gonna get the money, and he's gonna send you back. We putting our words. So I could have an impotent leg. Because they do not take a, a Quebec health care in Alberta. No, they don't. Because of the problem of the province not paying or taking time to pay him back and everything, you know? So that was pretty that was pretty bad, pretty, you know, it was pretty... Uh, so how did you end up back in Quebec and, uh, and training people? And okay, uh, after the, when my time was done and everything, I had a few scuffle uh, with the, the guys in the training camp, with uh, Giant Divine. Uh, I had a few scuffle with, uh, with some guys down there and everything, you know. So uh, it was time for me to leave. And then um, Smith was operating a wrestling, a heart wrestling school in Cambridge Kitchener and then uh, I got a, uh, and then when I had the trouble down there um, Smith uh, got me a plane ticket flew me there so I stayed there and I became the teacher like basically of the camp and uh, that's how I started training people and then uh, some of them were just lazy fat kid who just want to be in the business or their money's got or their dad's got money and just hang out around wrestlers uh, just because to pursue their dad's dreams or their mom's dream because they're big big fans of wrestling but a kid doesn't give a damn a lot of them but i had one kid especially his name is about uh, it's jeremy fritz who is aka or eric young you know showtime eric young i saw that kid he was a little bit fat he was the, a delivery guy man at a restaurant and uh, to pay his uh, wrestling camp and then one day he brought me at his home it was about an hour away from Cambridge and then he said Carl I want to I wanted I wanted to see you uh, some of my tape because you used to you used to do wrestling uh, backyard wrestling on a trampoline and put up his own show with his friends and everything and then you know I saw that that was pretty rough but I said man we got potential here so that's why I started to uh, train him the bumps, the good bumps, the way that Bruce taught me. I taught his, you know, all his, all his wisdom, and I brought I brought like the dungeon training in Cambridge, basically, and start giving, uh, teaching the bumps to the guys and the ropes and everything. And then I especially took time with this guy and everything, you know, to train him. And then uh, give in that time when I was teaching, gave all the guys stuff to not to do. When I went through. Don't do the same mistake as me, you know. Say what I do, but don't do don't, don't do what I did. So that's what happened. And I had a few guys that I trained down there, and then um, I started to become good. And that's I think that and I decided to be that. That's my spot to be trainer. To pass the advice it was so rough for me. You know, if I can have some, if I can have some kids who want to do it and willing to pay the price, but not the same price that I did pay. Uh, let's try to change the mentality of wrestling. That's what I try to do, you know. So, different approach, encourage, motivation, uh, pretty positive in my classes and everything. And then end up uh, teaching the guys like Rory McAllister, who became the Highlanders at WWE. Uh, so I trained few guys, who, uh, few guys who, who kind of did it on the big league in the big leagues. And after that, and after that, uh, my dad opened the FLQ in 2000 and then uh start training trainings and you got like guys like uh rami or sammy zane there back yeah. then he's he, i wrestled you there yeah you wrestled me at the field twice you, yeah twice and then you wrestled at ncw yeah you called nickel back then uh, yeah, 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 yeah your, your name yeah. and everything and then uh yeah and your chop were big and then he, i remember you came to the crawl man i know your chops are big so you know we did kind of a chop competition and everything, and then uh, I think in the business, your chop, they're they're pretty hardcore, they're pretty nice, well, pretty stiff, and pretty dungeon. pump. Huh? You learned that in the yeah, dungeon. Yeah, I learned that in the dungeon, yeah, for sure. Um, and then um, I opened the FLQ and everything, and then, uh, and then some guys started, you know? And back then, in Quebec, like I said, I tried to change the mentality. If you wrestle for a promotion, you're not allowed to go anywhere else. 
But I said, listen, if the guy wants them experience, you gotta go everywhere. So I opened my Fed and I decided, oh, you're coming from this wrestling, it's from this Fed, oh, you're coming from this Fed. It's not the same day, it's not on the same day that you wrestle, you're not making any money. Me, I, I'm, I'm doing my show on a Friday, you, were, you wrestle somewhere else on a Saturday, come and wrestle and get experience uh, if you want to make it one day in the business, you know. And also, uh, Jacques, if you're going back to Jacques before I finish with this guy, is uh, Jacques, you're in his camp, you're not allowed to leave his camp. If you go somewhere else, he blackballs you. So I said, I don't want to bring that mentality to my kids that I'm, I'll be teaching and everything, you know. So... Oh, I have to ask you, since you bring up Jock again, were you uh, ever around when Kevin Steen was in the camp? No, because him me, I was gone. I was in Calgary back then, you know. But I met Kevin once because I came to see one of the... Uh, I saw him once. Uh, he came wrestle once for me and everything. But um, you see, a lot of people today brag that they started Kevin Owens, you know. But who really started Kevin Owens is Kevin Owens himself. He's the one who paid a sacrifice to go on the road and everything, but it's pretty awkward that he doesn't have the physical body like the average wrestler that they train all their life to be at that part, but he got it. So I guess that Triple H shot something to him, but he's the one who pays dues and travel everywhere and everything, and it's funny today that everybody put up pictures of him, so he started here, but... You do, Other you, than me. Yeah. <laughs> Other than you, there you go. There you go. So that's why I'm saying I understand. I can understand and everything. You got your philosophy and everything. Me, I got my philosophy. It doesn't need that we hate each other. But, well, man, he's champion today. We don't know why. I don't know, man. It's it's um, something you cannot explain. But people who claim that they're the one who make him, yeah. he make himself. We'll give, we'll give that. He made himself, really, you know. Uh, so I just have one question, one yeah. final question on Kevin C. Yeah. You've been around Quebec and you know like all the backstage stuff. Yeah. Has, have you ever heard of him getting in a real fight ever in his life? That's no. His Strangely enough, the few time I was sharing backstage with him, he was a quiet guy in his corner. Uh, I didn't hang out with him, so I can't tell you. I didn't go out for a drink with him. Uh, right. I didn't hang out after shows with him and everything. Mia was, uh, we were crossing her path different promotion, hi, respect me, respect him, dress in my corner, dress in his corner and everything, that was it, so I got nothing but, even if I can, if I heard story where I can, if you want me to give you a story, I don't have any story bad or, or good, that's what I can say about Kevin Owens. And today, uh, you're still operating your FLQ? Yeah, I stopped because uh, my family quit, because my dad was getting old, my mom passed away, my brother was uh, uh, pursued career as being a bodyguard of the Premier Minister of uh, Quebec now, and my sister Hydro Quebec, that's an electrical company there. Um, so I stopped a few years, and also after like 15 years, with all the, the thing that happened to me and everything, it's like, wow, I, I took a break, and now it's been about a year and a half, I try to reopen it, uh, and then I see the wrestling business change from 15 years ago in the independent circuit, you know? Not independent circuit can be recognized and you can make a living out of it if you're smart out of it, you know? So, I tried to book some few shows, but I was missing something, you know? I was like, something's wrong, I don't feel it and everything. So, it was in 2013 when I tried to reopen it, a few shows, and then I said, I'll put a stop. And I go back to school. So from Toronto to Halifax, I start going all to those indie show. I wanted to find out what's going on. Who's good, who's not, uh, how it works, the mentality and everything. So even uh, I got the name, I went to the dungeon, I had a chance to be in, in the movie of Brad, did the WWF. Even after those years, when you stop, you have the circuit. Thing changes like a wheel. It's a circle of wheel, you know. Stuff change. Stuff really change, and you don't know what's going on, you know. And then um, I had to go back to school and we started to be a promoter, man. And, and look what's going on and everything. So now we can sell on my third show officially. There, it's going to be in Bose. It's going good, but it's a lot of work. I set up my posters, man, to make sure the posters are set up. You know how it is. 
You, run you don't your do it yourself. No you don't do it yourself. It. Nobody's going to do it. Even if you pay somebody, the guy's going to take the posters and put it in the back seat of the car and just wait for the show comes and say, oh, I don't know why. I put posters. You're a liar. Never, it's hard to trust people in this wrestling world of what promoters or what they do and everything. You got to set up your own thing. You got to sell your own tickets. Uh, you got to be there to set up the ring, unload the ring, you know. And then um, that's what I've been doing. It's a lot of work. You know what it is to, to, to be successful and to have people because what I hate, I don't have no more drive to wrestle in front of 50 people. If you don't have like 300 and more, it's hard for me to, to wrestle, I'll be honest. So if I want to get those 200 people, 400 people, uh, I go, uh, I try to find towns that, that can brought that people and uh, that can give me that energy, man. The 50 people crowd, man, I can't, man. And you know what? It's just like I had Celine Dion who sang in my wrestling ring last night at my show. If you have the biggest stars, so really on? yeah. But the example, let's have you. You have to to to, to understand oh, your see. point. Oh, yeah. You have the biggest star, but yeah. if you don't promote it, nobody's gonna know. Nobody's gonna come and show. Just like you, you bring stars at your at your federation. You drawing at hate nine hundred people. I saw it for my life because I've been part of your shows. But you do a lot of promotion there, man. And you promote the star that you got. So you're able to pay back what it costs, you know, because right. they don't cost for it. So I see a lot of Fed will bring big names. Good for you. But they're not going to do any publicity thinking that, uh, oh, well, we're going to hire him. He's a name. And then that's going to pack their house. Yeah, but if you don't spread the word, nobody's going to know that he's there. So you end up that losing money and paying the big fees for no reason. So I respect Feds that will promote and bring stars and everything. No problem with that, but you gotta promote them properly, and so you can take advantage of him, and he taking advantage of you, having good experience, spread the word out that you're a professional fan. Because, like I said, today and you got the WWE, NXT, Japan, and you got those little feds. We're about 20, like we're about what, maybe over 100 fed in, in Canada or something like that in the states. As much 30 in Montreal. Alone. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So what you do? Now you have different categories of Andy Fed. Why people want to rush and come wrestle for you? How come it's easy for you to get, uh, to get uh, answers from wrestlers for booking? Because so many out there, you're going to email a wrestler, I want you on the show. They'll say, wait, I'll come back, I don't know, because they're waiting for a better opportunity to go in, a, in another Andy Fed. Why your answers are so quick, Devin? I'll tell you why. Because you're having people at your show. It's fun to wrestle in front of six, seven, eight, nine hundred thousand people at your show. And if you give me a ch uh, you understand what I mean? Yeah. And one thing, but you know, so it's easy for you to have wrestlers, easy. But you have two type of indie wrestlers. Wrestler who wants to be champion in front of 20 people, and they'll be satisfied till that they get the belt. Yeah. But me, like I say, I prefer wrestling in front of a thousand people not having a belt or do a job to the, the champion of the territory than to wrestle in front of 20 people and having a belt. So, yeah. Exactly. You understand what I mean? So, if you don't work hard, you're working hard. It's basically your daily job and everything, your daily fucking work. You come out here today from your from Ontario to come here and do promos, interview people because you're having a star to come on your show. So you're getting some interviews and then put it on, on, on on, on the Animal TV channel YouTube. So, you know, you didn't need to come today, but you did. Why? Because you're passionate, you want to make works, and you know that you want to give a good experience to those big stars that you're bringing at your shows and having a good reputation. So that's that's what I think it is, man. And uh, is there anything you want to say to everyone that supported your family over the years and you, mm. you're, you've been very popular in Quebec? Yeah. Yeah, but you know what? I'm popular with the fans because of the name, but I take care of the fans, you know? Uh, I'm less popular with the wrestlers because, well, it's all a bunch of jealousy. You understand what I mean? Um, so the wrestlers who likes me, thank you. I'm grateful. And then uh, you're always welcome to my show. And the, the people doesn't want to respect me in their business. I don't give a damn. I'm doing my own thing. I know how to do it. I got experience. And I wish you good luck in your life and your booking. 
and for all the fans, uh, it's because of you if I'm still doing that. And it's because of you coming to see my show or whatever I go at any territories to or any promotion to wrestle. You come and support me and you always come in a bunch of group. So without you, I will not get any bookings. So first of all, I want to thank you guys, the fans out there. And especially I want to give a little piece of advice to the wrestlers who think they're superstar yet, but they're not. After your match, go take time to go sit out there at the merch table and go talk to the fans who pay the tickets to come and see you and buy your merch and stop being a prick with them, you know? You gotta show them respects because because of you, because of them, today you're able to get people in the crowd and because of their money, you're able to get a little paycheck. And if you want to get your paycheck better, start working your fans and respect them and take time to salute them after a show. And you know what? You're not a big star enough to stop by, to stop and not doing autograph, man. Take time to give a, take a picture with a selfie or whatever to the guy and an autograph because the kid is going to go back home. He's going to look to his dad and then you'll become his hero. hero. And then each time that you'll be somewhere, the kid's going to bugger his dad and then the dad wants to please his kid. And then what happened, the, the, the dad's going to drive his kid three hours, four hours out of town to go see his hero. You know, the hero that because he, he took time to get an autograph or something, just like you do. You know, you take time to salute your fan, you take time to shake hands, take pictures. That's what you gotta do to be successful in the indie business. What I hate is people, they leave, and then they don't wanna, they leave and don't wanna be seen, and they don't take any time to sign autograph for those people. So the reason why I'm popular, and the fans are coming to see me and cheer for me, or boo me, they don't care, I can be a heel with a face. But as a heel, the fan, uh, they know that at the end I'll still take time to respect them and you know what, I'm there to give them a show, you know, so that's what it's all about wrestling, it's entertainment, I remember this guys, it's entertainment, so I'm talking straight to the, straight shoot to the wrestlers who try, you know, to be superstar and avoid to sign pictures at the end of the show, man, you know, it's, their, it's your money, it's your bread. So if you want bigger money, prove me you can respect the fan and I'll give you better, uh, a bigger piece of the cake. And just to end it off here, anyone seen this that wants to follow you, we know you're on Facebook. Yeah, What's Facebook. You? It's uh, My Facebook page is FLQ Wrestling, FLQ Wrestling. And then, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it right now. Uh, like I said, I'll be starting. I'm back to school. I'm starting to, to know what's good, what's not good. Um, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm just taking off again. So I'm not saying I'm back on top, but I'm working to get back on top just back in the old days. But I gotta, but to get back on top, I gotta put the past and the success out of the indie scenes behind me, forget about it, yeah. and then restart it again, just like I'm a, I'm a new player though. Yeah. And uh, I'm still fortunate the fan is still there. Today I came to the show, that's not mine, and I walked in, took time to, before I get in, to shake everybody's hand and talk to everybody, man. That's how the people can remember you, and that's how the people's gonna come and see your show afterwards, you know? Yeah. Very good. Well, thanks for uh, talking with us. Yeah, thank you. That was a pleasure. And then, uh, you know, finally, I did that Audible TV show, man. I've, I've been watching you guys on YouTube. I said, I hope that one day they'll, they'll come to me and ask me questions. And you see, you came today to do your, your job. The show got delayed. I was on the spot. And I got invited in that, and I'm pretty happy that uh, I can spread some word. If you like it or you don't like it, that's me. I'm Carl Excel, Quebec wrestling terrorist, the size that hurts. So that's pretty much it, man. <laughs>